country of Pakistan is embroiled in a drama that hinges on when a particular font was introduced to the world and the outcome could bring down the country's prime minister. The drama known as Fontgate all began with an investigation into whether the prime minister and his family are corrupt. It's part of a joint investigation that started up after the release of the Panama Papers. Remember that? That was the leak that showed how wealthy people around the world can use secretive offshore tax regimes. So, as part of the evidence gathering process within Pakistan, the Prime Minister's daughter gave documents about her ownership of overseas properties. They were allegedly from 2006, but guess what? They were written in Calibri font. And as Fontgate would have it, it wasn't the default font on Microsoft until 2007. That means they could be forged documents designed to hide the truth about her wealth. But she's also tweeting the documents, proclaiming her innocence, because that's just what happens now, apparently. And it is true that Calibri was around as far back as 2004, but only as either a Windows pre-release product or as a separate download. The font's creator told Pakistan's leading English newspaper he is skeptical of when the deeds and such were written, saying, quote, why would anyone use a completely unknown font for an official document in 2006? Did you get all that? Yeah. <laughs> so yes, fonts are more newsworthy than ever. Thank you for having me. I confess that I'm a tad terrified to be addressing a Congress of type nuts who I deeply admire. Um, I think Type designers in particular embody a renaissance attitude about grappling with science, art, technology, and history. And also, type designers and typographers are intimate with the umlauts, macrons, and linguistic diacritic marks that, as a writer, I find incredibly sexy. <laughs> so, as Rich says, I'm an alumna of the School of Visual Arts Design Criticism MFA program. I joined Quartz directly after graduating. It's been four years now. As the only design reporter in the newsroom, my job requires being attuned to the design angle, sorry, of current events and business news. For instance, during the last presidential inauguration, I wrote the story about stagecraft and political pageantry. But as a penmanship nut, I was also particularly interested in the part of the program when the new president signs bills into law immediately after being sworn in. I remember watching the excruciating proceedings on C-SPAN and noted how Donald Trump took such a long time to write his own name. I timed it. As a journalist, you have to do this. His official signature, a jagged, loopless scroll reminiscent of a seismometer reading from a catastrophic earthquake, <laughs> takes about six to seven seconds and over 30 strokes to complete. In comparison, his predecessors, including left-handed Barack Obama, takes about a second or two to scribble their executive mark. And at that moment, I was like wondering, man, the wheels, the bureaucracy, it takes even longer because of this damn signature. From my training at SVA, <laughs> he confirms it. <laughs> so from my training at SVA, I write about design from the stance of a fan and a skeptic. In the overabundance of optimism about design today, I think it's a journalist's charge to look at each project with sobriety. More than ever, it's essential to probe beyond glossy surfaces and super neat case studies. Um, I think this yin-yang attitude, appreciation and questioning, applause and vetting is healthy and ultimately leads to better reporting, if not better design overall. Now, how do we determine what's newsworthy at courts? It's a fuzzy formula. But the story needs to fall within the intersection of interesting and important. As design is such a broad topic, my beat is rather wide, from fonts, why I'm here, to architecture, to cities. On top of that, every few weeks, all court staff reporters take a turn manning the weekend shift. This means you are the one reporter writing about anything that crucial that happens in the world that day, no matter what topic. It's a wonderful educational, 
and nerve-wracking assignment, and one that has taught me to find and recognize design stories in unusual places. So, why I'm here. As you imagine, I, the roster of stories at Quartz can be incredibly wide, so I was really flattered and surprised when, one, when Juan Villanueva invited me to speak here because he said, I wrote about fonts quite often. And I'm like, do I? I mean, what is he talking about? But then again, maybe he has a point. Actually, Quartz is a fonts news-loving newsroom. Several of my colleagues have written about the science or commerce of type, and one in this, this type story I wrote ended up on an Apple keynote when they introduced Apple News in 2015. But prior to Quartz, my first big assignment actually came from a type designer. The wonderful polymath Peter Bielak, founder of Typothek, works that work, and even before that, the superb visual culture journal, dot, dot, dot. For Works That Works' fourth issue, Peter published and paid me for an essay based on my graduate thesis about the nation branding of South Sudan. Now, this story isn't necessarily about fonts, but you bet I asked that designer if that was indeed Times New Roman and why was it distorted. Peter also encouraged me to pursue an investigative story about the world's forgery capital in Manila. As you can imagine, this is a highly illegal trade, and there was some element of danger. The site was incredible. I saw women on the street with penmanship notebooks perfecting black letter calligraphy used in diplomas. But what I really enjoyed was shopping for fake IDs and credentials. I mean, standing at that menu, I was thinking, man, who can I be? Es <laughs> Essentially, I could craft a new identity with a few scraps of parchment and plastic. But let me tell you how I ingratiated myself to Peter and maybe assured my longevity as a writer. Among the fake documents I ordered, is a Pulitzer Prize for works that work. And it looks like this. It looks bananas and absolutely fake, but Peter loved it and spent 20 times the sum I paid to frame it. Now, I first spoke to Juan and Charles Nix and Carl Cosgrove, I have not met in person. Is that you? Hi. <laughs> While writing about remastering the handsome serif wall bomb. Now, as you can imagine, if you're a general news editor, this story is really pushing the line for a general news outlet. I mean, will grandmas get it? I mean, that's like one question, right? Unlike design blogs, we're writing for the widest possible audience and constantly have to grapple with a so what question. But in their generosity and patience, Charles, Carl, and Juan actually helped, ex helped me explain the concept of optimal, optimal sizing for non-designers and cobble a story about the shortcomings of digital typefaces in general. The most satisfying stor design stories aren't really design, about design per se. This is what happens when you don't translate to the general public. A brief exchange with my friend Adam. <laughs> so the most, again, the most satisfying design stories aren't pure design stories per se. For instance, this story about IBM, sorry, about IBM's new corporate font isn't really about our feelings about Helvetica but about their bottom line spending. Before Plex, I, re I learned that IBM was spending over a million dollars each year to license new Hel Helvetica. Because of that cost factor, not all 380,000 employees around the world had the typeface on their computer. 
Similarly, this story about Canada's national font called Canada 150, aka Mesmerize, which I kind of like better, isn't about branding, but about representation. Its creator, Raymond Larrabee, took it upon himself to study and correct how Canada's Aboriginal languages are presented in type. After comparing handwriting samples and painted signs with commercially available fonts, he observed that the accents above letter forms are typically misplaced because fonts are designed for the Latin alphabet. Now, one general observation that you can debate me on. In interviewing many designers, not just type designers, I worry that not enough are interested in the larger context and repercussion of their work. Now, recently, I listened to a graphic design professor describe a study comparing the legibility of highway fonts around the world, a topic dear to my heart. The winner, he says, was Clearview, the US's former official highway font. Of course, the international gathering in Paris cheered this curiosity like a quasi-Olympics of fonts. But I politely asked the researcher what he thought about the fact that the Federal Highway Administration has actually phased out Clearview in 2016 because many states did not want to pay for licensing fees. Now, I may have misunderstood him completely, but he did not care about my question. Nor did he care about this bit of news. I wonder, as much as the public is curious about design, I wonder what might happen if designers took a greater interest in current events and in the culture they're shaping, as this conference suggests. Considering context helps us winnow the essential from the trivial. One had a funny question to me. He goes, what fonts do you use when you're writing? What a great question, right? Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but um, when I plot out large features, I usually scribble and make sense of the story in, in handwriting that would horrify my grade school penmanship teacher. But for quick stories, I draft in 14-point Calibri because my eyesight is failing. Um, I'm really grateful to be speaking about the news today. Um, I've actually taken a small break, book leave from Quartz. Um, I'm currently working on a book with Milton Glaser and his magazine design partner, Walter Bernard. And to prepare for today, I thought I'd ask them two legends about their feelings about fonts. Walter, a veteran art director who has shaped dozens of publications, including Time, Newsweek, The Atlantic, ESPN, and Fortune, taught me to stop hating on Time's New Roman. He says, it's a workforce type typeface that purposely designed for newspapers, shorter ascenders and descenders to fit more words on a column. Now Milton, who never answers a question without questioning your question, cautions against obsessing over a single element in communications. Well, like fonts, I don't think he liked my question. He says that if designers are to help shape a better culture, a better condition, we then must zoom out of our silos and embrace the broader context and significance of our work. So I leave you to stew on his answer to my question. So Milton, what about fonts? This is what he said. Thank you. <laughs> 